Welcome to the fifth lecture in the Henry VII series. Today we are going to examine Henry VII as a ruler and his style of government. This lecture will be split into four parts. The first section will examine the concept of personal monarchy and why it was popular in the late medieval period. The second section will examine the structure of Henry VII's court. The next section will examine different interpretations of Henry VII's style of government. Finally, we will examine the role that Henry's key ministers played in government. Personal monarchy is a style of government that is entirely focused around the personality and the will of the monarch. The king appoints ministers who he favors, based either on their skill or their personal relationship to the monarch. The king also takes informal advice from key family members and companions. With this style of monarchy, government is very centralized and parliament does not play an active role in policy making. If someone wished to advance in their political career they needed to be in the royal court. The amount of power that person gained was dependent on how physically close they were to the king. It is for this reason that it is very difficult to assess the extent to which a monarch like Henry VII used different advisors, since most conversations would take place behind the closed doors of the king's privy chamber. The layout of a king's court was therefore very important. The royal court was a very public arena. The king was often on display in full regalia. He would host banquets, receive foreign dignitaries and receive petitions from representatives of the different regions. This place is like the front face of a corporation today, it was formal and designed to impress. Foreign ambassadors would often report back to their home country about the grandeur of England's royal court so it was important to present an impressive image. The royal court would often be large, receiving a place at court was enough to place someone into high esteem. However, to be of true influence, you would wish to be invited into the king's privy chamber. The privy chamber simply means private room. In reality however, this was a series of rooms, like the royal apartments in Buckingham Palace today. They were the rooms the king went when he retired from his formal business. However, this did not mean that the business of the day stopped. He might invite his closest advisors to dine with him or enjoy pastimes like a game of dice or cards. The king would also have a number of gentlemen of the chamber who would act as his companions during this informal time. They could receive incredible favor and influence, depending on the king's personality. Henry VIII was far more influenced by these men who became the favorites of court than his father Henry VII. The most important servant of the privy chamber was the Lord Chamberlain who managed access to this more private and intimate space. In 1496, Henry's Lord Chamberlain Sir William Stanley was involved in the Perkin Warbeck plot. As a result he was executed for treason and Henry became less trusting, so access to the privy chamber was curtailed to only his most loyal advisers. It was also common for a king to move his court around the country. This was called a progress and usually took place during the summer months. It meant that the king could visit other regions of his country to help establish his royal authority. It was also a way of bestowing favor on trusted noble families, since hosting the king as your guest was a prestigious, if very expensive, honor. Henry went on royal progress in the summer of 1486, one year after the Battle of Bosworth and even visited Yorkshire. This was a risky move since it made the king more vulnerable to assassination attacks and plots. Lovell and Stafford staged a plot while the king was on progress in Yorkshire in 1486. However before embarking on his journey north he had already secured the loyalty of the south of England, where the plot took place, and he had also established a spy network that was able to foil the plot before it got off the ground. Henry's use of royal progress helped him to establish popularity in that crucial early stage. However, 
If a king spent too much time on the road, this could weaken central government, since it was harder for the king's chief advisers to manage finance and pass laws through parliament. That is why Henry was mostly based in London. Let's now examine Henry's personality and how this influenced his style of government. The traditional interpretation of Henry was that of a ruthless king who was frugal in his spending and mean in his treatment toward the nobility. Traditional historians compared his rule to the extravagance and opulence of the reign of Henry VIII, and therefore judged that he was austere, some even going so far as to say that he was a despot or tyrant. Certainly, Henry had a more reserved personality than his more famous son. He did not elevate many courtiers to the nobility and he did not spend lavishly on gifts for his favourites. However in 1501 he built Richmond Palace, named after his ancestral earldom of Richmond, showing that he was willing to invest in buildings that would promote the prestige of his dynasty. Henry also knew that as a late medieval king he had to foster an image of royalty and wealth. And this included hosting banquets pageants and tournaments to impress the nobles and aristocrats plus any foreign dignitaries that were visiting his court. For example, in 1505 he welcomed Polydeer Virgil to his court, who was an Italian writer and part of the early humanist movement. He was what you could call an early 16th century influencer and his arrival at the English court has been seen by some as an indication that England was entering the Renaissance by the turn of the 16th century. One key decision that Henry made was to move the royal treasurer into his royal chambers. This is called the chamber system. Before this, royal finance was managed in the exchequer, which was a separate department. By moving royal finance into the chamber, Henry was able to personally supervise royal finances. This has led traditional historians to consider him a miser, a penny counter who was frugal with spending. According to traditional historians, Henry VII kept his circle of advisers and confidants small since he did not trust the powerful magnates who had supported the Yorkist kings. He had been raised in exile so was effectively a stranger in the country he now ruled. This meant he had very few men with experience of managing government that he could rely on. However, revisionist historians now believe that Henry was not untrusting. By the end of his reign he had built up a good number of advisers who all brought to court their own expertise and provided him with good counsel. Henry's closest companion was his uncle Jasper Tudor, who had accompanied him into exile and so was the closest Henry had to a father. He was an experienced military commander who had fought in some of the early battles of the War of the Roses. He was elevated to the position of Duke of Bedford and joined the Order of the Garter. Despite this close relationship, Henry allowed Jasper to step away from the royal court. He was awarded Cardiff Castle and was responsible for the governance of his homeland of Wales until his death in 1495. Another important advisor was John de Vere, the Earl of Oxford. He was a devout supporter of the Lancastrian cause but had been forced into exile during Yorkist rule. During that time he had engaged in privateering so had considerable naval experience. He was made the principal military commander at both the Battle of Bosworth and the Battle of Stoke. He was given several prestigious roles within Henry's government as Lord Admiral of the Royal Fleet, Captain of the Yeoman Guards and Constable of the Tower of London. Therefore it is fair to say that the Earl of Oxford was given considerable responsibility for ensuring the domestic security of the crown and helped to create a strong military force that would keep Henry's position safe. John Morton was another important advisor. He was an experienced member of the church, having served Edward IV as Bishop of Ely. He was then stripped of his position and sent into exile under Richard III. Following Bosworth, Henry summoned Morton back to court and he soon took up the most senior secular position of Lord Chancellor and the most senior church position of Archbishop of Canterbury. Then in 1493 he was promoted further to the office of Cardinal. Morton was arguably Henry's chief advisor until his death in 1500. 
However, unlike Henry VIII's chief ministers, his role was to administer the king's will and laws, rather than to follow his own agenda. He was a competent servant to both the church and to government. On his death in 1500, the Spanish ambassador remarked, The Cardinal of England is dead, and has left no statesman behind who can be compared to him. Another notable advisor was called Sir Reginald Bray. As a member of the gentry, we do not have a portrait of him, so instead, here's a portrait of my cut called Reggie. Before Bosworth, he was in the service of Henry's mother Margaret Beaufort, but was promoted to the role of Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster in 1485. This was an important position as it meant he was essentially in charge of finances and judicial system for those who resided on these extensive crown lands. Therefore, he was responsible for the patronage of lesser ministers at court. In 1499, he worked alongside the king to open the council learned. Wick historians have painted Reginald Bray as an architect of a new, more modern regime. This is because he was a new man, a member of the gentry, who employed servants according to their skill and acumen rather than their social status. He was also considered an architect in the literal sense because he project managed building projects across the country, most notably Jesus College in Cambridge and St. George's Chapel in Windsor. These building projects have been used by some historians as evidence to suggest that, by the second half of Henry's reign, England was experiencing the Renaissance. In 1503, Reginald Bray passed away. This was a critical turning point in the way in which Henry's court was governed since it saw the sharp rise of lawyer and gentleman Edmund Dudley. Unlike the rest of Henry's closest advisers, Dudley was a self-made man who had risen up the ranks at court due to his astute intelligence and his understanding of the English legal system. From 1503 onwards, Edmund Dudley took over the council Leonard in the law and began to use it far more prolifically than Reginald Bray had. He used it to issue financial penalties to misbehaving noblemen using measures that had dubious legality. As a result he gained a notorious reputation. Finally we have the king's mother Margaret Beaufort. Her son awarded her a tremendous level of status and independence for a woman of the late medieval age. She could own property independently to her husband and she signed her name as Margaret R. The R standing for Regina or Queen. She was offered the wardship of two noble brothers, the Duke of Buckingham and the Earl of Wiltshire, until they came of age, meaning she effectively raised the next generation of noblemen who would go on to serve in her grandson's court. She also worked closely with Elizabeth to arrange the dynastic marriages of her grandchildren even trying to intervene in the marriage between Margaret Tudor and James IV since she was still a minor. Since Margaret had been forced to marry aged 12, she did not wish her granddaughter to suffer the same fate. From 1503 to 1509, following the deaths of both her daughter-in-law Elizabeth and eldest grandson Arthur, she was essentially the queen at court and she organized for Prince Henry to have a new household so he could prepare to become king. Though little is officially known about her role in government, since as a woman she could not reside over royal meetings, she was known to accompany the king on progress and in residence. The Spanish ambassador reported in 1498 that Henry was much influenced by his mother in affairs of personal interest and in others. It is therefore hard to dispute that she was a consistent and steadfast presence at his court, who devoted her life to serving him. When her son died in 1509, she ensured the smooth succession of her grandson Henry VIII and it was her suggestions that he took for the first members of his council. It was her swan song. She died only two days after her grandson turned 18 so could officially rule without a regency and only two months after her son. The myth goes that she took ill after eating a signet for dinner. A fitting way for this queen that never was. Let's return to our overarching question of how did Henry VII rule England? In any essay on this topic I would open by explaining how England followed a late medieval model of personal monarchy. This meant that those closest to the king were the ones who wielded the most power.
I would then explain how the structure of a late medieval court facilitated this. The king would make public appearances and formally receive guests at the royal court, but it was behind the closed doors of his privy chamber where the real decisions of government were made. I would link this to Henry's personality. In 1485 he was a stranger to his newly conquered kingdom so he naturally distrusted all those who had been part of Richard III's court. However, over time, he was able to build up a closer network of trusted advisers. Henry has often been portrayed as frugal and dour, but there is evidence that by the turn of the 16th century he was evolving into more of a Renaissance king. Finally, I would familiarize yourself with the names and roles of Henry's main advisers, especially paying attention to those who were important at both the beginning and end of his reign. It is worth remembering that all of these men were little more than royal servants. Unlike in the reign of his son, Henry was always the one in charge of policies and decision-making. There is little to suggest that any of the personalities you have learnt about in this lecture were able to sway or manipulate his decisions, apart from, of course, his mother. Thank you for watching. Tune into the next lecture where we will study the structure of central government in greater detail and examine the role that both law courts and parliament played in the running of Henry's government.